right, boys and girls, here we are. I'm going to share again the Founding Fathers, Creators of the United States by John Mallon. Um, I'm going to read you another couple sections. The sections I'm going to share today are George Washington, War Hero, Articles of Confederation, the Constitution, Constitutional Convention. And um, as I said the other day, one thing that we do when we read nonfiction is that we want to maybe take some notes on some interesting facts or um, ideas that we hear as we read. So a graphic organizer with you know a center topic and ideas would be a great way to do that or write these headings down and then put three bullets under each one um, so that you're sure to capture some um, information as I read out loud to you. So um, George Washington Hero is where I'm going to start. As early as 1778, George Washington was described as the father of his country. The American Revolutionary War was still being fought, and it was to be another five years before the United States of America could call itself an independent nation, completely free of British control. George Washington raised to be a tobacco farmer. George Washington was born in 1732 on his parents' tobacco plantation in Virginia. He studied English, mathematics, and geography at school, but as the son of a farmer, his real education did not come from books. Instead, the young Washington learned how to be a tobacco farmer, like his father, grandfather, and great-grandfather before him. And the generational passing on of jobs is just not as common anymore, so it's kind of neat to hear that. Mount Vernon Estate. Washington's older brother, Lawrence, was in charge of the family tobacco plantation at Mount Vernon, Virginia. When Lawrence died in 1752, Mount Vernon was passed on to George. Aged just 20, he was now head of one of Virginia's wealthiest estates. For the next 20 years, Washington farmed his Mount Vernon estate. He enlarged the main house, increased the size of the estate to 8,000 acres, and bought slaves to work the land. Um, I'm going to read the rest of the informative pieces, and then I'm going to go back to the caption pieces and show you the pictures. The French and Indian War. Starting in 1754, Great Britain and France fought each other over control of North America where both nations had colonies in what became known as the French and Indian War. Washington fought for the British. His military career had begun, and in 1755, at age 23, he was made the commander of British colonial troops in Virginia. His life was nearly cut short when four enemy bullets ripped through his coat and two horses were shot from under him. The fighting ended in 1760, when Britain won. Washington had proven himself to be a natural leader. After the war, he returned to his life as a farmer at Mount Vernon. The Revolutionary War. The peace that followed the French and Indian War was short-lived. To pay for the war, Great Britain increased the taxes paid by her American colonies. The colonies protested, and the American Revolutionary War followed in April 1775 as a result. That May, all 13 colonies sent representatives to the Second Continental Congress, which met in Philadelphia. The state of Virginia sent George Washington, having shown his skills as a general in the French and Indian War. Washington was elected commander-in-chief of the Continental Army. He took charge of the ill-trained army that lacked leadership, but under his command, he turned it into a disciplined fighting force. The armed struggle against Britain lasted six grueling years. Finally, in 1781, Washington forced British General Charles Cornwallis to surrender at Yorktown, Virginia, two years later, and the last British troops left American soil. Retires to Mount Vernon. The war had ended in victory for the colonies, and Washington became a national hero. In December of 1783, he announced that his army life was over. His job was finished. He planned to return to his Mount Vernon home and his other life as a farmer. But his country would not let him go that easily. There was still work for George Washington to do as a new nation began to emerge. And we all know he became our nation's first president. Um, so here we have him, and it says, Washington in New York City on evacuation day, 
ha November 25th, 1783, after the last British troops had left. And then down here in this frame, it says um, George Washington as a young man. And he has his ringlets. And then over here, the British surrender in 1781. And then here is a picture of Mount Vernon. Um, the mansion was enlarged to a 21-bedroom residence by Washington over a period of 45 years. So he was in charge of that for a very long time. There you go. So now I'm on to Articles of Confederation. A significant act of the Continental Congress during the American Revolutionary War was the creation of the Articles of Confederation. This was the first attempt at creating a written constitution, setting America on co course toward its first national government. Penman of the Revolution, Revolution, the Articles of Confederation, which were drafted in June of 1776, were largely the work of John Dickinson, Pennsylvania. He was known as the Penman of the Revolution because of the, the many official documents he had already written for the Continental Congress. He was also one of the best legal minds in the colonies. Dickinson wanted the 13 colonies to join together to form a firm league, a friendship, or a confederation toward a national government. The Articles granted important power to the Continental Congress, which allowed it to act like a national or federal government of all the colonies. Congress could send ambassadors to foreign countries issue money, borrow money, set up a postal system, declare war, make treaties, control the affairs of Native Americans, keep an army and a navy, call on the colonies to provide troops and money in time of war, set standards for weights and measures, and settle boundary disputes between colonies. So they had a lot of roles and it says the first page of the Article of Confederation. So this image back in here is what they're talking about. And then um, down here, John Dickinson lived from 1732 to 1808. And then you can see the snake over here from an early flag. Join or die. Oh, that's friendly. All right, let's see about this friendliness here. Distrust of, gov of national government. The Articles of Confederation were supposed to create one government for all the colonies. However, that raised a problem. At the time the Articles were drafted, the colonies were fighting for their independence from an all-controlling government, Britain. Would a national American government be any better, or would it upset the colonies by interfering in their internal affairs? Because there was a distrust of national authority, the Articles of Confederation got off to a bad start. And it was not until 1781 that all 13 colonies agreed to adopt them. A famous political cartoon created by Benjamin Franklin, it shows a snake cut into pieces, the pieces representing the different colonies. The message to the colonies was clear, join together to act as one body or die. Um, let's see. During the American Revolutionary War, the Continental Congress issued paper money known as Continental Currency. Each colony issued its own money in dollars, which were used to pay the troops of the Continental Army and buy goods. In total, Congress issued uh, 241552780 in Continental Currency. However, because Congress did not have the same value held in gold or silver to back up the paper money, the new currency quickly lost its value. To make matters worse, the British government put fake dollar bills into circulation. In 1781, continental dollars had become so worthless that they ceased to circulate as money. Any worthless object was described as not worth a continental. <laughs> um, that's kind of funny. Continental dollars issued by different colonies during the American Revolution. Okay, and then here's that snake that Ben Franklin did. And you can see the money right there. And our last section for today 
the Constitutional Convention. By the mid-1780s, it was clear to many Americans that the Articles of Confederation were not working. The 13 original states were looking after their own internal affairs, leaving the fledgling nation with a weak federal government. The states were not united as one nation. Something had to be done. And it began with a quarrel between Maryland and Virginia. The Potomac River Dispute The Potomac River flows between the states of Maryland and Virginia. However, instead of being divided down the middle, which is how river borders are usually agreed, Maryland had been granted the whole of the river. This upset Virginia, which wanted an equal share. The federal government had no powers to intervene. An idea takes shape. Before the Maryland-Virginia quarrel got out of hand, James Madison suggested that officials from both states get together to work out a solution. This discussion between the two states took place at George Washington's Mount Vernon estate in March of 1785. As a next step, they decided to include Pennsylvania in future talks. Seeing how the states were cooperating with each other gave Madison a new idea. He wondered if all 13 states could agree on forming a federal government. In September of 1786, five states met in Annapolis, Maryland. They proposed that all states should send delegates to a meeting in Philadelphia the following year. And then here's James Madison down here. You can see the different important people communicating in a map. A government without a visible head must appear a strange phenomenon to European politicians. And then let's see, James Madison, a man with a plan. James Madison gave a lot of thought to the idea of a federal government. A few weeks before the meeting in Philadelphia, he wrote to the officials of the 13 states introducing his idea. By the time the delegates of the states met at the Constitution, Constitutional Convention, also known as the Philadelphia Convention. In May of 1787, Madison's plan for a federal constitution were well known. The state of Virginia sent two delegates to the meeting, James Madison and George Washington. The Constitution is discussed. The convention was held at the Philadelphia State House. It began on May 25th, and George Washington was appointed the presiding officer. From the start, James Madison spoke convincingly about the need to replace the Articles of Confederation with a Constitution, a set of rules that laid down the basis of the country's first national government. Through the summer of 1787, a total of 55 delegates from 12 of the 13 states attended the Constitutional Convention. Only Rhode Island didn't attend, as it felt a strong federal government would end up taking power away from the states and leave them weaker. So here is George Washington at his Mount Vernon home um, estate where the ideas that led to the Constitution were de debated. And down here, the Philadelphia State House where the Constitution was held. Oh, the convention, excuse me, the convention was held. There you go. So that was today's reading about our founding fathers. Um, I hope you took some great notes. And I will um, share some more history with you another day. Bye.